This is uh, the afternoon session on, uh, on technology. And uh, they had first asked me to speak at this conference. And they said, you know, Ben, what would you like to speak on? And I said, well, one of the things I've been doing research on at the Illinois Institute of Technology recently is ethics in high-frequency trading. And I'd like to speak on ethics in high-frequency trading. They called me back two, two days later, and they said, they said, you know, nobody's interested in that. So, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to be the chairman of this afternoon's uh, session. But I do think it's an interesting to topic, and while I do have a captive audience for uh, three or four minutes here before our first speaker, um, I'd just like to point out that um, I think a lot of the confusion in high-frequency trading comes from the differing ethics that the different um, professional disciplines, that being traders and quants and, and, uh, and programmers, um, come together to build high-frequency trading systems. And, and I like to think, and maybe that's not, not true, but I like to think that you know, nobody shows up to work in the morning and says, I'm going to be unethical today. Um, but, uh, but that we all come from our own professional backgrounds and that we all come with our own professional ethics. Certainly, traders have, well, traders have at least exchange rules they have to live by. Um, uh, computer engineers have um, IEEE uh, engineering ethics, things like this. Um, and, and quants, quants have ethics. It's usually superseded by mathematical truth. Um, but, um, but when they come together, oftentimes these ethical standards uh, often conflict. And I think that gives rise to a lot of problems and perceived ethical lapses in high frequency trading, which I really think is not right. Um, and one of the things I've been talking about in a lot of my research is to simply point out that, um, you know, that I think if, uh, if as an industry we can come together and, and derive some, uh, some ethical standards that cross national boundaries, that cross professional boundaries, that cross um, uh, uh, traditional boundaries between um, you know, securities and derivatives, uh, futures and, and, and bonds, um, that um, we would be a far cry better than letting, for example, Washington, um, people in Washington, um, okay, Barney Frank, tell us what our ethics are. Because uh, I think that in the end, uh, letting Washington decide what our ethics are, I think, has a huge left, fat left tail for all of us. And, um, and I think that, that could be very bad. A third standard deviation event from Washington, I think, could be, could be a bad thing. So uh, that's why I keep harping on, on this as something I think is an important topic, even if we sometimes choose to ignore it. Um, that certainly putting on the appearance of taking ethics seri seriously um, is, is in some ways a defense against um, ambitious uh, regulators who would sort of seek to create their legacy on, on the backs of uh, what is really a, an important industry uh, for, the, for the future of the world. In any case, there, that's, uh, I've said it, and uh, we'll move on. Uh, today's first speaker is uh, Peter Van Cleef. Uh, Peter Van Cleef is a managing director at Lakeview Capital Market Services. And uh, prior to his role at Lakeview, Peter managed significant hedge fund type investment portfolios and quantitative trading departments for, among others, Cooper Neff, Solomon Brothers, Hypo Varens Bank, and Credit Lyonnais. He has nearly 20 years of experience in the development and operation of sophisticated automated trading operations. He holds an MBA degree from the Owen Graduate School at the uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He's a frequent speaker on complex arbitrage strategies with a focus on volatility arbitrage and high frequency algorithmic trading. He's also a well-known consultant uh, to the investment community with regards to tra trading, risk management, operational, and strategic issues. Lakeview Capital Ma Markets uh, provides a large range of trading and risk management related services to its clients. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Van Cleef. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction, very kind. Uh, so hopefully I can live up to that. Um, actually, I'm trying to advance this, but it seems like you sure this works? Okay. Too quick. 
high frequency slide changing. You tell me when, when we're good to go? Good. Ah, okay, excellent, cool. Uh, topic of the day, uh, HFT arms race, uh, developing technology matches strategy needs a cost effective way. I think that's on everybody's mind. Um, you know, of course, you know, you can go downstairs and you can buy everything that's out there and you can spend millions and probably not make a dime out of it. Um, so the key thing really, uh, you have to make uh, a decision, you know, what you're going to invest in, where, where really is your edge, uh, what, what really helps you uh, to make money in the market. And uh, being in the business for a long time, I mean, as, as was said in the introduction, uh, I'm almost like 20 years in, in, in the business. Um, and a large part in electronic trading, high frequency trading. So uh, let me iterate as I'm trying to do frequently. It's not really something that you know was developed last year or two years ago or four years ago, but basically there's some people, uh, even in this audience, have been doing that for you know 20 years or even longer. Um, and uh, sometimes it feels like it's it's kind of helpful to be around that long because then you see things happening and, and actually. Uh, you know, the older I get, the more of a sense I get that there's some waves in the market where, you know, people get very excited about certain things and then they do things and, you know, they find out that some of the stuff is good and some of the stuff is maybe less good and, and beneficial and then at one point, you know, it kind of reverts somewhere to the mean and, you know, some people stop doing things and, you know, things get out of favor for a while and then they get more attractive again. And then I want to give you a little bit of background on that, I guess, in the talk. Um, so the key questions you always have to ask yourself if you, if you go out and think, well, uh, you know, do I spend some money on, on any kind of technology and any kind of consulting, any kind of, uh, you know, stuff that hopefully helps me to make money, uh, what are the components? So clearly it's market data. You know, without market data, you can't really do anything. Um, you know, you have to have some data to work on uh, because it's, uh, the computer is doing things, right? You're not having a human sitting there that, you know, works on emotion and feelings, but you have a computer there. Uh, then, of course, you know, once you have the data uh, and you have some results, you want to trade that on the data somewhere, so you need market access. That could, that could be a substantial um, uh, differentiator, you know, how you access the market. There's a lot of regulation coming out now uh, that determines actually how you're allowed to access the market, uh, what the markets, uh, you know, will be able to provide you or what they should provide you. So that's definitely something to put attention to. Um, then clearly between sort of like the, mar the market data and the market access, this is where you develop stuff. Um, and uh, then you can develop in several different ways. I and mean, there's, there's proprietary tools you can use. Uh, some of the tools that uh, have been come out over the last couple of years, uh, generally in algo trading, not necessarily in high frequency trading, but in, in general algo trading have made it very easy for people to develop stuff. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's just some graphical boxes where you draw some lines uh, between them and you connect them and it makes it e even for non-programmers very easy to develop stuff. Um, they have, of course, certain advantages in terms of speed of getting somewhere. On the other hand, you, you might have, you know, a drastically increased latency. Uh, portability is the next to nothing if, you know, sort of like you want to port that to, to maybe another platform, which you might do in the future. Um, then, of course, the testing thing. Um, there's tons of people, um, you know, especially in the more traditional investment industry or even the hedge fund industry that, uh, you know, you can really go to with a great back test and they say, well, okay, you know, great back test and, you know, that uh, looks, uh, in the simulation looks fantastic, let's put some money on that. Uh, the problem in high frequency trading generally is that, you know, the back test is, is never really going to be very good uh, because a lot of t strategies that you have in high frequency trading rely on, you know, you trading either at the first level or somewhere between the first level bid and ask, somewhere mid-market or, you know, somewhere within the spread. Uh, and also, you know, depend on what the market reacts to in terms of what you send to the market. So this stuff uh, is very hard to test. I, I, I've yet to see a simulator that actually accurately predicts what will happen if I put a certain order in the market or if I hit the bid or lift the offer. I, I haven't really seen that. So all you can hope for really in, in my mind is really to see what might be potential problems with your strategy. Uh, clearly, once you got all this stuff sorted out and you're thinking about deployment, uh, there's of course many different deployment options and it's always amazing to me that people, you know, invest in, in high-end technology and then in deployment basically ruin all the advantages that they might have uh, because, for example, some, some key features, you know, located at a central office, whereas, you know, some of the other components are located at the lowest latency possible infrastructure, uh, uh, but they always have to wait for a message from central office or, or some feedback from central office and get slowed down by that uh, and, and that people don't really think through the whole setup. Uh, I just want to then give a quick overview of a, of a typical setup, uh, I guess, for uh, because there's always some people in the audience that are fairly new to this and, you know, haven't been in this for, you know, extended years, just to have an idea what that might look like and then uh, comment a little bit on latest developments. 
Um, okay, how do you identify uh, good value product service offerings? Um, you know, what, what, what do you need your provider to deliver? Uh, you're competitive. Uh, and it's really, I think that's one of the key messages. It's really, for most people, it's about being competitive. And that's really where things are going for the moment as well. Uh, to have the goal to say, I want to be the fastest in the market, that's a very high goal. Uh, and you can spend really, you know, a lot of time and a lot of money on trying to be the fastest and might never get there. And the amount of money you're going to be making out of being really the fastest and, you know, uh, that, that amount is limited. I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. The money, uh, you know, you're not going to have, uh, let's say, IBM in Germany and IBM in Frankfurt, you know, crossing each other, the bid ask spread adjusted for FX, adjusted for transaction costs. Uh, and, you, you know, arbitraging that in size, you're not going to trade millions a day. That's not going to happen. Uh, the same, you know, if you look at, you know, cross, other cross-listed products where it's a simple arbitrage, you know, one on the other, uh, just being the fastest, I mean, the amount of money you spend in comparison to the money you're making is probably not, you know, the highest payoff bet you're ever going to make, and it's very challenging. So that's something you definitely have to think about. You know, is it actually worthwhile, the money I'm spending, in comparison to what edge I'm getting, and so how sustainable is the edge? Uh, beginning of uh, so mid-90s, you already had a technology race uh, when exchanges moved to electronic markets. Uh, one firm I used to work for, you know, we used to be located somewhere in Switzerland. Um, you know, initially we were the fastest because we were the only one do it, doing that electronically. Then we moved from Switzerland to the southern part of Germany. Then we moved from southern part of Germany to Frankfurt, where the exchange was. Then we moved to a building closer to the exchange. Uh, and then at that point it was finished because we asked the exchange, can we put our servers into your building? Uh, it took him like a week to, to think about it, and then they said no. Now it's basically a service they offer for a couple thousand euros, so that's how the world changes. Uh, but in principle, th at that point, that was it. And we spent an uh, incredible amount of money on, on machines. Uh, I mean, back then we spent over a million DMARCs, half a million euros, you know, of, uh, let's say somewhere around, you know, of, uh, six, seven hundred thousand dollars on, on a computer, right? I mean, can you imagine what computer you can buy these days for that amount of money? Crazy. Uh, and in the end, you know, at one point it was just finished. It was just someone faster, and then we had to look for other things. Um, which products are worth investing in, and, and which don't add value? Um, for example, it's a lot of investment going into uh, what was also mentioned in the, in the panel that we had uh, previously on big data, you know, data storage, data retrieval, data manipulation. Uh, any high-frequency trading strategy that, that needs massive amounts of historic data that is very complex is not really high-frequency trading strategy. I mean, there's no way you're going to be the fastest if you have to sift through three years' historic data uh, to make a decision on trading. That's just impossible. I mean, if you want to be the fastest in any kind of market, uh, then the decision that you make or the decision process has to be very, very, very short uh, and very sweet and, 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 you know, without a lot of historic data. So usually you just need current market data and you need uh, usually not uh, huge amounts of, of, of history. That's something that was mentioned as well uh, in, in the previous panel that, you know, in high frequency trading, most people, uh, they don't back test on like five years tick data. Uh, basically they, they develop on, let's say, the last two or three months because market structure changes, competition changes. Uh, and then you see, okay, is there any big flaw in this? Does it seem like it's working? Okay, let's try to run it with like one or two lots. Uh, and uh, then let's see how we're going and, and learn from the real market because then you also get the interaction and the whole environment and a lot more information out of the market. So what are the options for real-time data? You can get it from the exchange. I mean, that's, of course, the best way. Uh, it's fast, uh, reasonably accurate. I mean, you would be surprised how many uh, problems exchanges you sometimes have with the data. Of course, they wouldn't tell you. Uh, depending, you know, what exchange it is and what your member status is, it might be cheap or expensive. Uh, usually with most of the memberships, uh, uh, you, you get some data, uh, or basically you, you get the data, let's say, if you're a market maker, so for the high-frequency trading firms that become market makers, uh, usually the data is not, uh, not the big cost there. Uh, you can, of course, go to a feed provider, and there's a big difference. You know, there's feed providers, you know, do this stuff in software, feed providers that do that in hardware. Uh, feed providers that, you know, really have a shared infrastructure where, you know, you get slowed down by being on the same pipe with lots of other people, uh, potentially, you know, asking for access, uh, historic data retrieval. Uh, so there you really have to drill down. So there really it's hard to, to generalize and say, okay, is it going to be cheap? Is it going to be expensive? And there really comparison pays off. So, so you, can, you can save thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially if you're a bigger organization on data. If, you, if you're talking to the right people, you know, talk to your broker, ask them what data they can provide. Uh, some of the brokers have like resale agreements with the exchanges. They can give you the data for next to nothing that, you know, you go down the street, you talk to the provider. They're going to charge you 5,000 bucks a month for the same data. They cost you 250 if you ask your broker. Uh, so that's really worthwhile making a comparison here. Then uh, that's the last point here, the broker feed. That can be very cheap. 
Uh, but then again, you have to be careful. Is, is that a broker that actually has a business model that is supportive of, of uh, uh, high frequency trading, or is that someone that just says, okay, we're just going to throw in the data for our customers for more or less free just to get them trading? But then maybe if um, you know the infrastructure is really unreliable, it's really slow, uh, and and it's reflected in the attitude to a high frequency trading. So there, it really makes sense uh, to explore that and and see what what they can often really drill down and say, okay, you know, how you're processing the data, how many guys are on the data feed, um, you know, how is it uh, passed on to me? Is it is it via an FPGA? Is it via software? Um, you know, how can I how can I hook up to that feed? Um, you know, if you're doing any kind of normalization cleaning, that's another important thing, uh, you don't necessarily want to have people clean the data. You know, if they clean out stuff that actually happened in the market and your algorithms are triggered by what, hap what would be triggered by that data, you might, you know, be in a situation where you cause your own flash crash because, you know, maybe there's some trades in the market that would go make your algorithm go crazy uh, and your broker was so kind to filter that out, which of course makes your algorithm look great, but then when you deploy it, uh, might be a different story. So you really want to make sure, okay, that's the case. Uh, just a very recent example as well. Uh, we were hooking up uh, one of our clients to, to a provider uh, where it actually turned out they had uh, accurate data for level one and, and the tick data, but uh, then basically the order book was delayed 250 milliseconds. I have no idea why the programmer did that, uh, but it seems like even for the last three or four years, none of their customers figured it out. But we immediately found out because one of the strategies uh, that we implemented always made money, and when you put it live, it didn't make money. Uh, and actually it had to do with the data feed that I had a problem with sort of like the order book relationship to the quotes. So that's, that's you know, it's just fine print that you really need to check to evaluate the quality here. Uh, and then data shouldn't be that expensive because in the end, the brokers and, and service providers, they need, to, they need to provide you data. Without data, there's no starter. So that they should be interested in getting you the data. Uh, historic data, you know, is a question if you actually need that. Uh, of course you can record it and that's probably the best way because then that clearly is your latency is your market access. If you test a strategy on your own recorded data and you have a proper facility to replay that, then you're really running on your own conditions. Uh, you know, if you buy somebody else's recorded data, I mean, he might, you know, uh, have its own timestamps, which highly depend on his infrastructure that might or might not be relevant to you. And, you know, you might pay a lot of money for it, but it might, completely, it might be completely irrelevant to you. So if you buy the data from the exchanges, usually they tell you where they take the timestamp. Again, as a question, if that timestamp is accurate, you might have markets where uh, you know, they have different uh, facilities or different matching engines, where maybe you even have different timestamps, depending which one uh, the, the timestamp recorder was connected to. So again, there's some fine print, which you know, only for the fastest guys probably will be relevant. Uh, but definitely have a look at that. Um, of course, you know, historic data you can buy from the exchanges uh, due to the perceived quality. Uh, that's usually quite expensive. Uh, may caution you a little bit as well. Uh, some of the exchanges are not really putting so like the best infrastructure on the recording. They're just saying, well, okay, we just offer this as a service and the recording and the timestamps might not be accurate uh, to a production environment that might be reflective of, of, of your actual usage. So a lot of times, uh, you only have find really out once you do a little bit of your own recording and, and compare with the exchange data and then see, okay, if those timestamps are actually reflective of, of what really is relevant for you and what is relevant for the exchange. So we definitely advise you to do a little bit of own recording if you can or get a tool uh, that allows you to do that in a proper way. Uh, of course, data providers, again, it's a big range between, you know, cheap uh, internet, you know, you can get uh, traded data, uh, you know, not, not, not order book tick data uh, from y Yahoo, Google, uh, stuff like that that's cheap depending on your strategy. Uh, you know, if you're just uh, running on last traded prices, I mean, um, and you know, you're not in, high free, uh, in ultra high frequency or, uh, you know, in, in the seconds of trading, which for most people is high frequency. You know, we're talking about here milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds. Uh, you know, the, the for Joe Blow and the fund manager on the street, I mean, even like trading, you know, 10 times a second or five times a second is high frequency trading. Uh, so it really depends on, on, on your setup, but that, that's definitely something to explore and say, you know, if for your strategy, do you actually need that, that high quality or perceived high quality data uh, on, on tick data? Uh, of course, and broker provided, and again, that's, that's usually your, your good option to say, well, I, I'm going to bring business to you, I'm going to trade with you, I'm going to do through my executions with you, and if you help me going, uh, get going, then, you know, we can do more business, so they have a big incentive to help you, and a lot of them have, have, uh, have a good setup and getting more and more uh, of a support uh, uh, setup that, that helps you to get going. So that's definitely something you should explore before going out to any vendor out there and saying, okay, you know, uh, your data offering looks good, let's, let's get that. Um, 
Market access. Membership, of course, uh, uh, you know, is, is kind of the best thing. Uh, if you look at all the regulation that's coming out, uh, I would almost bet 100% that market makers will always be exempted from any kind of transaction tax and things like that. Uh, because otherwise, you know, you won't really have any market makers anymore. I mean, if you say, uh, you know, we're going to basically uh, have minimum resting times, we're going to have transaction tax. I mean, it's very unattractive to be a market maker. People will, you know, widen the spread, costs will go up. Uh, and then probably they reverse that. So membership usually these days, or generally, uh, even historically, hasn't been really that expensive. It's dedicated as fast. And that's, that's one of the things that people forget a lot of times when you look at providers, uh, brokers, service providers. Uh, dedicated uh, is sometimes very important. You know, if you have your own server, you have your own pipe, it's like having your own uh, satellite for mobile networks. If the market goes crazy, it's your own infrastructure. It's not other people going through the same pipe going on your infrastructure. Well, that's definitely what you should ask for, or that's what you look, should look for if you do your own setup as a member, that you don't go through shared infrastructure, because that's a big advantage, that basically, if, you know, if the market goes crazy, you know, you have something like September 11 going on, you know, you can't reach anybody by mobile phone because the mobile phone network is overloaded. If you're in shared infrastructure with a broker that, you know, even is professional and says, well, maybe I only have two or three clients on one machine, you know, market goes crazy, that machine probably is already loaded with the market data coming in, and then if the other guy is in a similar business and they want to do a lot of trading, probably no one gets a line. You know, lines are busy. Your latency goes from microseconds to milliseconds and, you know, maybe to the tens and the hundreds of milliseconds. That's another thing you have to look at. You know, if you look at real market data, you see that some of the major markets, I mean, their capacity, um, they, they don't have any capacity to actually trade in, in microseconds. I mean, they, they can take orders in, in you know, single digit milliseconds or, you know, maybe slightly below that. Uh, but, you know, if the market really gets busy, I mean, that, that might get to, to multiple milliseconds even. Uh, co-location uh, is kind of becoming a must-have these days, and that's, that's really where you see the commoditization. Let's say if you're a fund manager and you're, let's say, sitting, uh, you know, let's say in Canada, and you want to trade CME or you want to trade New York or you want to trade Frankfurt, uh, and your, your ALGO strategy runs, you know, in Toronto, uh, I mean, just the latency going back and forth, you know, don't talk about microseconds. You know, that's what sometimes puzzles me. You know, people spend money on having a co-location or having, having sort of like a co-location in, the, in their point of residence uh, and then basically having fast data lines, fast, you know, everything. Uh, but then they go across the, the Atlantic and then you have jitter in terms of like the line that you have, let's say, from, you know, New York even to Frankfurt or London uh, and back um, that is far in excess of anything uh, that, that you have on your trading infrastructure. Um, so they're definitely, this, the, here prices are coming down and, uh, you know, uh, the, the real distinguishing factor is you shared and dedicated. And, and you know, ask yourself, uh, you know, if you can share with some other guys, like I said, it's a, it's, it might be a problem if the market gets really busy, uh, but it, it definitely brings down costs. So that's a real trade-off to consider. DMA, uh, that's pretty much the standard these days. Cheap, shared, medium, fast, or slow. Really depends, you know, which provider you go to. Another thing to consider, you know, if you want to trade 10 different markets, you know, if you, if you keep the APIs up to, uh, to date on every market, that's the cost by itself. That's, 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 that costs you money. Uh, if maybe your provider, your broker can provide you an FPGA solution that does normalization, the latency that you add by that uh, might be insignificant in comparison to the own jitter that you have on a software implementation if you write to all the native APIs. So there really is a question to ask, you know, what is out there uh, and really clue yourself up. DSA, that's another thing that's coming up, direct strategy access. The people basically provide you the infrastructure uh, in the co-location with the optimal setup, uh, and you basically just send them the strategy and they run it for you. Uh, that might sound very strange to people, you know, uh, saying, well, okay, but this is like my IP, this is like my, my intellectual property, my knowledge, and I, why am I supposed to give it to other people to run? Um, well, I mean, if you think about it, you know, Apple doesn't do the iPhones, the iPads. I mean, they give it to some guy, you know, in China to produce the stuff, and they're, they're happy with it. And, you know, there's tons of other industries where that's completely standard to use service provider to do certain things for you that they just do, you know, cheaper, quicker, better, faster. So that's another thing you can think of. You know, maybe looking for a provider that says, okay, you know, I share this cost, you know, amongst all my customers. I do, I do a real, well, uh, real good setup. And, you know, you, you just focus on what you can do best. You know, you just write the logic, the strategy that really gives you the edge in the market and you send me that and I run it for you. And that might be a, an option in the future. Might, might sound a little bit far out there, but, you know, let's talk again in two, three years. Remote access, of, of course, that's very cheap, uh, shared, but, but uh, too slow for that stuff. So any kind of internet access, probably forget that. Um, 
development, uh, in-sourcing versus outsourcing, local staff remote, experience hires juniors, developers traders, standard language proprietary. Quite easy the answers here if you think about it. Um, in versus outsourcing, you know, where's really your edge? The stuff that really gives you the edge, that's probably the logic on the strategy, that's probably mostly you want to do in-house. Maybe you get some outside help, maybe some, you know, if you want to enter a new market, get some experienced traders in. Again, you know, the, the experience is really what you pay for. Um, you, you can have tons of guys from university trying to come up with a great strategy. I think usually it's much quicker if you look at new markets, new products, you get some experienced guys in and get a kickstart. And then they can, you know, build up the juniors behind them and, and build a bigger bench. I think that's the way to do it. Uh, developers as a traders, of course, you need both these days. I mean, just have a guy that, you know, uh, nothing against the floor guys. I used to work on the floor as well. Uh, but, you know, the guys are just a great traders and just work on instinct but can't really, you know, put in words how they trade or, or you know, what actually their strategy is and, and cannot tell that to a computer. That's very difficult. So you need both, really. Uh, standard language proprietary, again, you know, there's this languages coming out. Uh, or people, are, you know, some of the algo systems use, use for example, like, uh, well, I would probably consider a standard language like Lua or something like that, uh, where, you know, it's, it's maybe easier or quicker to, to write strategies and, and to get somewhere. Uh, but technology is changing. And, uh, you know, if uh, systems are changing, your setup might change. I would always advise you to go for something like, you know, C++, Java, C, something like that. Uh, prob uh, probably something you know, without any, any sort of proprietary libraries, ideally, uh, for the strategy development. Because if you really want to be fast, I mean, forget the software stuff anyway. If you want to be the fastest in these days, you have to do hardware. So if you do software, uh, I don't think, you know, it would be sensible to kid yourself and say, okay, I'm going to be the fastest just, you know, uh, doing that on, on whatever compiler you're using uh, in, in low level C. Uh, I don't think you will get there realistically. So, uh, you know, whatever you're doing here, uh, and software will always be slower than hardware, so then it doesn't make sense uh, to go for something that then will also not be portable anywhere, I think. Hardware or software, as just mentioned, you know, if you want to be the fastest hardware, uh, if it's basically for testing the logic, testing a strategy, um, you know, developing ideas, definitely software. Uh, in terms of IP, full automated automation, best protects intellectual property, I think that's, that's something really, uh, again, you, you have to look at and say, okay, if I have a strategy that has any discretionary aspect in terms of like, okay, you know, maybe the strategy stops at a certain point and the trader has to decide when to switch it back on again. Uh, that, that then really depends on, on the trader making the right decision. When does it switch on and when does it, you know, leave it switched off and something like that. So real capture of intellectual property also that's something that you can run, let's say if the trader disappears, is really only if you achieve full automation. And that's, that's again something that I find fascinating that a lot of people, you know, build very high frequency systems, but then, you know, intermittently still have decision processes by the trader in there, which of course is never going to be high frequency. And, that, and that, that really then, you know, puts in question why you make all the effort on, 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 the, on the infrastructure side if intermittently you're still relying on a trader making decisions. Um, outsourcing possible with loss of intellectual capital, that basically goes back to this uh, DSA. I think, you know, a lot of the stuff really becomes commoditized. That's what you're seeing in the whole high frequency trading. It's really becoming, you know, people building factories these days. You know, not everybody's building their own car anymore, but people building factories so that everybody can have an airbag, everybody can have, uh, you know, night vision to recognize pedestrians on the street, everybody can have distance control in a car. Uh, that's, that's what you're having these days. And that's something you really should look into and try to take advantage of and say, okay, where can I get a factory that basically, you know, does a lot of the stuff at, at a very reduced cost. I think the way forward today, uh, only for very few companies, is, is to build everything themselves. On the, on the testing, if you want to spend money there, back testing in high frequency. Uh, I mean, if you show me a great uh, uh, strategy, like on a, on a good back test and it's supposed to be high frequency, I think that's completely meaningless. Um, uh, don't want to be really too negative on this, but uh, you know, it's good for finding big errors. You know, does your strategy do something crazy, like cause another flash crash? Uh, you know, do you want to have a rough idea, sort of like what what the profit potential is? Okay, maybe for that. Uh, but you know, people spend so much money on backtesting engines on databases that allow them to do you know extensive backtest quickly, and then you know they they spend you know half a year de a year developing something, they put it live, and it just doesn't work, and that happens over and over again. Uh, so. I think this stuff really, you know, take it for what it's worth, you know, find the errors, find that, you know, you're comfortable with the general setup, but then go to live, live trading. Live simulation is somewhere in between. 
which is kind of helpful to develop some intuition and see the, st the strategy trading live. You also see maybe other markets. You also see maybe news flow coming out. You get sort of like an idea what market might be good for it, what market might bad, be bad for it, how you know it, it reacts to certain market changes. Uh, that's that's much easier if you do a live forward test. And and again, but it's not very reliable. Uh, it's it's maybe a little bit better than back testing, but not not uh, to a large degree. Uh, this usually is done fairly easily. Uh, on the other hand, there's very few providers that provide you a good good live matching simulation system. I mean, even the the you know simulation uh, environments of most of the exchanges, to be honest, are quite dismal. Uh, so I think that would be something where they could definitely do better. Uh, so like have a replicated matching engine type thing where you could properly test strategies or at least reasonably properly test them. Live trading, I think that's really the ultimate thing. Uh, so here, you know, I would advise you not to spend too much money on this stuff. Um, you know, make sure, okay, it's safe, but then when it's safe, then, then go out and, and trade it and see how it does and, and try to improve from there. Uh, because that doesn't really cost you much. I mean, trading one lot, two lots, uh, you know, you're not going to lose a fortune there. Uh, deployment, own infrastructure. Uh, of course, you can, again, build everything yourself. Uh, you, you're also carrying the operational risk. That's for a lot of people. Uh, you know, that come from a more traditional background, getting into that. I mean, pension funds uh, that maybe need to use high-frequency trading tra technologies, at least for the executions, they're not necessarily happy to carry operational risk. I mean, of course, you can be extremely fast. You know, if you do everything yourself, you get the best guys in the world to do that. Okay, that, that might give you the edge. Uh, but again, how much money can you make out of that edge? Shared infrastructure is cheaper. Uh, then, of course, the problem is operational risk. But really, you know, if you're sharing with other people, uh, you might have the problem that, that really operational risk multiplies. So there you have to find a compromise. And I think most of the times the compromise here is, again, talking to some of the brokers out there and, and some of the new emerging, so like factory providers, infrastructure providers, and say, okay, how much can you actually give me dedicated? How much can you guarantee me that when it comes push to shove, I have some dedicated space, but generally let's, let's try to find cost savings. Let's try to find synergies. Let's try to work together. Uh, microwave, for example, is a classical example. You know, now these days uh, downstairs, I think there's four or five microwave providers. Uh, to build your own microwave link is very expensive. Uh, we're talking to a lot of the European trading firms, which have you know some of our main uh, customers and people that we work with, and they're happy to share. They're saying, well, this is just another road tax for us. I mean, basically, you know, we're happy to eliminate you know 80, 90 percent, but you know, we're also real realistic about it. You know, us five, ten that are you know sort of like playing the speed game that are at a cutting edge. You know, we're all going to buy into this, and we can all buy into it separately, uh, and we're going to have very similar speed, or we can just share the costs and, and then basically slug it out in some other way. And I think that's, that's really what you're going to see a lot more. Uh, typical setup, I mean, review that at your leisure because I only have 30 minutes. Uh, basically, you usually have some data stuff. You have some calculation. You have a production server, some test simulation backup server. Usually, you know, there's some data exchange between them, and then, of course, uh, the production uh, machine is here directly on the marketplace. It's usually, you should have some separation between data, calculation, and production. So not uh, from one to infect the other one if there's any problems. Uh, but that, that's a different topic. Um, just to round things up, because I'm running out of time, uh, give a quick rundown here. ASP, Application Service Provision, uh, Software as a Service. I think that that's really becoming more uh, sort of like the, the general state of things, so that you can try before you buy, that you can rent for, for a certain period of time as long as you need it. And if you don't need it anymore, you know, you give it back. Direct strategy access, that really use other people's pipe infrastructure, achieve cost savings, uh, and basically just have them execute your strategies. Uh, that's, that's actually interesting business models for some of the leading firms in the market as well. Uh, that you might want to resell some part of your infrastructure. I mean, uh, for example, Timber Hill is a classic example. Uh, they used to be one of the leading firms in high-frequency trading uh, or in, in market making, and then they realized at one point, okay, building all that infrastructure just for ourselves is just ridiculous. Let's resell it. Let's start interactive brokers. Uh, and and uh, you know, uh, now that's probably making more money than a market making. Uh, proximity host and co-location. I've already went through the GPUs, graphics processing units, FPGAs. Uh, that just quickly, I think FPGA is actually a better solution. Um, GPUs are fairly easy to access. I have that on my laptop. I can, I can write software on that pretty much instantly. FPGAs are much harder, but pretty much anything you can do in a GPU, I think, or most of the stuff that's relevant to high-frequency trading, you can do in FPGA uh, just quicker. News feeds, social networking, that's kind of the next frontier. Um, I think that's, that's definitely something to look into because that's, that's you know, what the guy from UBS was talking a little bit about. You know, if you have your own data, if you have new data, if you have different data than the other guys, 
you might be able to front run the other guys by miles and, and not in microseconds. Um, okay, so where is the edge coming from? And that's really the last slide, sorry. <laughs> Uh, don't want to extend too much. Uh, I really believe, you know, even, you know, at the end of the day with all the technology, being smart and more creative uh, and not just fast, that really gives you the edge. I mean, a lot of people that we, we work with, that we talk to, you know, three or four firms say we're the fastest. When you look at the code, when you look at the strategies and the executions, it's usually because, you know, they make the decision either a little bit earlier or they pay a tick more than the other guys, a little bit more aggressive. Uh, and, and in the end, it's not because they're faster. It's, it's basically they make a different decision at a different time. Uh, being more flexible and adaptive, not just focused. I mean, markets are changing, opportunities are changing. I think that becomes a key thing, to be flexible. So don't be boxed in into one infrastructure in one system. Things are changing rapidly. Uh, and being more efficient and scalable, and that's another thing. You know, be able to scale. And, and once you go on an industrial platform that allows you to scale, that makes it much easier as well. If you want to replicate your setup and it's all custom built and in-house, a lot of times it's quite difficult actually to scale that. Um, yeah, that's it, all I have to say. Half an hour is not very long, so hopefully we're still half, half more interesting. Any questions? Do we have time for at least one? One question? Any question? Too much information, too short a period of time? Okay, there's one there in the back. Uh, yeah, actually, I think medium to long term holding is much more risky than high frequency trading um, because, of course, in a longer time period, a lot more stuff can happen. Uh, to be honest, uh, if you look at the, at the leading firms in the market, uh, you very rarely, if at all, have ever seen any of them really blow up and have a real problem. Uh, it's due to the testing that they do. I mean, as long as you have sort of like a, a kind of four eye risk check in the sense that you use the, the risk check potentially that's provided by the exchange and you own, and you do sensible testing on the strategy. Uh, I think it's a very small risk that your, your system will do something that it's not supposed to do. Also in high frequency trading, usually lot sizes are, are smaller. So you don't trade, you know, 100,000 lots one shot at the wrong price. Uh, you know, if on one lot you confuse uh, size with price, I mean, probably you have zero market impact because you just basically get consumed by the bid and the offer. Uh, seriously, I mean, I think high frequency trading is probably one of the lowest risk businesses you ever have. Uh, if you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the profits of people are in high frequency trading business, the overall amount, as we heard uh, again on the panel today, might not be matching of the five top ten guys in, or you know, leading guys in hedge funds in terms of you know, the big macro guys. Uh, but if you look at the return on capital and the return on risk, it's absolutely outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, no, not at all. I mean, that's exactly, I think, what I, what I try to say, that, you know, it, it's good for finding big errors. So, you know, where, where you have, like, a sort of like infinite loop or where you have, you know, uh, exponentially increasing sort of, like, size in the algorithm or things like that. Uh, that that's what you find in backtesting. But for that, you usually don't need, you know, five years of backtest data. Uh, maybe if you take, you know, a couple of days even or, or maybe even only a couple of hours of, of actual market data. Uh, you might, if you have, take data from, you know, events that were disruptive, you know, like September 11, Carriel, uh, so like coming out in, in, in Europe, things like that, uh, and test against that, and then have some wild, you know, simulation, uh, so like uh, generated data by yourself uh, that, that, that you test. Yeah, you, you just want to find the errors. Once you, I mean, that's, that's the main thing in, back, in high frequency trading, I think in back testing, you really want to find, okay, are there any big errors in logic? Are there any things that are overlooked? Uh, and once that's safe, um, you know, go ahead and, and run it live. And, and the risk check, I mean, that's one thing I want to add to that. I think I'm a firm believer, and I think most of the high-frequency trading firms agree on that. Uh, the, the, the risk check really should be done on the exchange side for everybody equally. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult to regulate and make sure that, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500 members of a market, they all implement appropriate risk checks. It's so much easier if you say on the exchange, everybody has to go through the same check. It's a, it's a road tax at all in terms of latency that everybody pays. 
uh, and everybody has to go through that. Um, and then you can let basically anybody on the market with any kind of order, because then that would be caught by the central risk check. And that would be such an easy fix. Now, I really don't understand why people don't do that. OK. Yeah, but uh, uh, not, not, not really. In Germany, it's also, I mean, it's Europe. So it's, it's the same obligation, uh, actually, in, in the UK and, and Germany. But uh, sorry, I'm, I'm being called off the stage. <laughs> so maybe we can take this, uh, the conversation offline. Just one last thing I want to say to that. Um, uh, even if the broker does a risk check, I mean, he can configure it. But uh, the operation and, and the system should definitely be on the exchange side. It would make it so much easier, I think. OK, sorry about that. So I, otherwise, I get thrown out.